Good afternoon. I'm Carlin Bowman, a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and I'd like to welcome all of you and our C-SPAN audience to today's event called Donald Trump and the Future of the GOP. Let me give you some background. Henry Olson, a former AEI colleague and now a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, has long been one of the nation's most astute observers of the Republican Party. His 2015 book, The Four Faces of the GOP, written with political scientist Dante Scala, has been widely praised for its analysis of different factions within the GOP. With this new poll, he is able to look at one of the most important new groups, Trump voters, and put them under the polling microscope. Henry has been a regular participant in AEI's Election Watch program, and we're delighted to give him this forum to discuss the new poll. Late last year, Henry approached YouGov about doing a survey of 2020 Trump voters. YouGov agreed, and they partnered with the Ethics and Public Policy Center and Henry to survey 1,000 Trump voters from January 11th to 14th. The survey only looks at self-identified Trump voters, so it is not representative of the Republican Party. The questions Henry wrote look at politics, culture, economics, and social issues. The top lines of the survey will be available for all of you when we send out an event summary within a few hours of this event. We're also very fortunate to have a superb panel to share their reactions to the survey. All have had the opportunity to review the poll. Joining us are Kristen Soltis Anderson, co-founder and partner of the polling and strategic firm Echelon Insights, Daniel Cox, an AEI research fellow and director of AEI's exciting new Survey Center on American Life, and finally, Sean Trendy, an AEI visiting fellow and senior elections analyst at Real Clear Politics. All of their bios are available on the AEI website. Henry is going to give an overview of some of the poll's major findings. He will speak initially for 25 minutes, then we will turn to Kristen, then Dan, and Sean. We will allow time for your questions at the end of the program. You can submit questions by emailing samantha.goldstein at aei.org or on Twitter with the hashtag AEIGOPFuture. Before getting started, let me thank Samantha, Samantha Goldstein, who has done great work in helping us put this event together, working with Jacqueline Clements, Skylar Pollock, and Brendan Raskus at AEI, and also our wonderful events team. And I'd also like to thank Josh Britton at EPPC, who was very helpful in getting the invitations to the event out. So Henry, why don't you begin? Thank you very much, Carlin, and thank you all for spending your lunch hour with us to talk about that most interesting of topics, uh, Wither the Trump Coalition. Uh, I'd like to start again by thanking YouGov, both the team in San Francisco, headed by Samantha Lux, and the team in London, with which I work, uh, Marcus Roberts, uh, with, and for everybody at AEI in uh, ethics in putting this together. Uh, let's dive into the data with some slides, and I will uh, turn my face off so that you can focus on the face that matters, the face of the Trump voters. Again, this is only of people who are self-described Trump voters. So when you see liberal, moderate, conservative, very conservative, or other demographic breakdowns, this is not of the general electorate as a whole. This is only of Trump voters who describe themselves by this appellation. We start with the question that's on everybody's mind. Does Donald Trump dominate today's Republican Party? Well, among Republicans who voted for Donald Trump, he starts in a very strong, but I'm not sure I would say dominant position. We ask these voters if they are more of a supporter of Donald Trump or of the Republican Party. Two thirds of the people who voted for Trump said they're more of a supporter of Trump than the party, but that means 34% said they weren't. And as you can see, the number of people or the share of people who say they are more a supporter of Donald Trump than the Republican Party rises with self-perceived ideological conservatism. In other words, the ideological base of the Republican Party is likelier to say that they are more of a supporter of Trump than the people who are more likely to depart the party when you actually have a general election. Throughout, I think one thing that we need to look at when I use ideological self-descriptions is the group that calls themselves conservative. This is the largest ideological breakdown of the poll, larger than very conservatives and significantly larger than liberals and moderates. As my work with Dante Scala showed, the group that calls themselves conservative in Republican primaries vote differently 
than those who call themselves very conservative. And they have the notable distinction of being the only ideological group that always backs the winner. And the very conservative group has only backed the winner once since 1992. And that was when George W. Bush uh, started as the candidate of the conservative center and expanded to become the favorite of the very conservative right when his colleagues and challengers on the right, Gary Bauer and uh, Steve Forbes dropped out. Here we see that two thirds of the conservative voter is more of a supporter of Donald Trump than the party. And then the shares drop the more hard support for Trump we try and find. If Trump runs in 2024, 54% of his voters say they'll definitely back him. That's 52% among the conservatives. Is it very important if he doesn't run that the Republican candidate for president is loyal to him? Well, 40% of Trump voters say they are, only 36% of the conservative voters. And it's worth noting that the very conservative voter is only about 34% of the Trump coalition. As Carla noted, this is not representative of the Republican party as a whole because there are a number of Republicans who voted either for Joe Biden or for a third party candidate or voted down ballot while skipping the presidency. These will surely tilt the numbers within the broader Republican primary electorate away from Donald Trump's favors. So this is kind of a high watermark for Trump's support within the modern GOP. Slide two, please. Trade is one of those issues that gets hackles up. It's something that Donald Trump broke with Republican pre-Trump sentiment on by embracing, if not protectionism, certainly an aggressive approach to recasting trade relations. And when he was a nascent candidate coming down that escalator in Trump Tower, the two issues he harped on repeatedly were immigration and trade, immigration and trade, immigration and trade. As we see, there's a substantial block of people within the Trump coalition who would generally agree with Donald Trump's non-traditional non positions on trade. 40% say that trade hurts America's economy rather than helps it. And that number rises for people who switched parties, Obama in 2012 or voting for a third party candidate and voting for Donald Trump in 2020. What unites more of Trump's coalition than divides it is the idea that trade reduces jobs for Americans. Whether you think it's in good in the abstract or not, 60% of the Trump voters think it reduces jobs. And that rises to 71% of the voters who switched from Obama to Trump. Now, there's a note, 16% of all voters of who for Trump in 2020 were people who in 2012 either voted third party or voted for Barack Obama. So that's a sizable number. And it's one that the Republican Party cannot afford to lose as it goes forward to turn Trump's 47% minority into a 51% majority in the 2024 election. Majorities of all social classes among Trump voters believe that trade reduces jobs for Americans. That's the poor, the working class, the middle class, and the self-described upper middle class. Regardless of what they think about trade, they all think it reduces jobs, and that's an overriding voter sentiment that Republican leaders cannot safely ignore. Slide three, please. Immigration is a issue that Trump, again, rode to prominence, and it's one that largely unites the Trump voter base, but not one that is as uniting as other issues, as we will see. Uh, two thirds of Trump voters believe that America should reduce immigration and 62% believe that the United States should deport illegal immigrants rather than either giving them safe status within the permanent residency within the United States without giving them a path to citizenship or providing a path to citizenship. In the 2016 primaries, most Republican voters in all but two states a majority supported a path to citizenship. There it was given a binary choice, path to citizenship or deportation. This strongly suggests that the sort of Republican who might re-enter the party uh, in 2024 would again be somebody who supports the pre-Trump consensus rather than the Trump position, making this more of a 50-50 issue. But look at this two on the bottom. 
The question of building a wall on the United States border with Mexico largely unites the Trump position. Even 78% of the people who say they're more of a supporter of the Republican Party than Trump support this position. And a whopping 89% say that the federal government should require employers to certify potential employees are legally able to work in the United States before hiring them. That includes 88% of the reporters, supporters of the Republican Party. This is essentially mandatory e-verify. And this might be a way for a uniting and an olive branch uh, to non-Trump voters, a way to talk about immigration while adding to the Republican pie rather than dividing it. Slide four, please. There's a lot of pre-Trump conservatism that still exists in the Trump coalition. And that makes sense that the vast majority of Trump voters are people who voted for Republican candidates in the past. In fact, 56% of the Trump voters in 2020 voted for Mitt Romney in 2012. And of course, a number of people who don't fit in either the Obama Trump or the Romney Trump category are people who aged into the electorate since 2012. If you were 17 in 2012 or younger, uh, between 17 and 10, you were eligible to vote in 2020, but you were not eligible to vote in 2012. And that's a group that is also likely to be substantially more Republican than this, uh, as opposed to uh, party switching. 74% of the voters say that government does too many things that charities and private businesses could do better. That is kind of the top level anti-government support that reflects the pre-Trump consensus. Even 68% of the party switchers, Obama Trump voters, agree with this top line figure. Other figures in the poll that we don't cite here include strong support for the idea that government is too big, strong support for the idea that taxes is too high. But look at this other question. 45% of Trump voters believe that government should guarantee a minimum standard of living if people work to the best of their ability. That's a sort of government intervention that you never hear about from the hard right. And it's not a surprise that only 33% of the Romney Trump voters and a minority of very conservative voters agree with that. But when you move up the ideological scale into the party switchers, that becomes a much more popular position. 53% of moderate to liberal voters agree that government should guarantee a minimum standard of living for people who work as well as they can. And a majority of the party switchers do. This again shows that talking about anti-government, the more specifics you put on an anti-government or a small government platform, the more you drive away potential allies than you do attract them. And we'll see that very clearly in the next slide. Supply side economics and Paul Ryan's entitlement cuts were all the rage 10 years ago in the Republican party. And if you ask virtually every candidate running against Donald Trump in the Republican primary in 2016, they would have endorsed these in theory, if not in detailed specifics. But look at how they divide the Trump coalition. The first question asks whether, what's the more important value for social security? Keeping benefits for future retirees at the same level they are now even if we have to raise payroll taxes, nearly two thirds of Trump voters would rather raise taxes to keep social security benefits at the same level for the future retirees than the people who would prefer to keep payroll taxes level, even if it means benefit cuts. This is a value that is shared regardless of the ideological perspective. Even the very conservative base, 60% of people would rather support keeping social security benefits the same and raising taxes. Take a look at the second question of the big entitlement uh, spending uh, question that people often talk about on the right. Is it a more important value to control the cost of Medicare to taxpayers or to ensure that every senior citizen can get the health care they need regardless of the cost to the rest of us? That question divides Trump voters. 55% prefer cost control, but 45% prefer keeping uh, health care going, even if it means that we have to pay for it. And again, this is an ideological question. 63% of the very conservative base prefer cost control. 43% of the liberal and moderates who are 20%, over 20% of the Trump voters uh, do not. They prefer cost control. 57% prefer keeping healthcare the same. And this is a big split on party switchers versus party loyalists. 63% of Romney Trump voters favor controlling the cost of Medicare only 46% of Obama-Trump voters say the same. 
And then look at the cardinal virtue of supply side economics. That is based on the idea that cutting the rate of taxes paid by the wealthiest Americans helps increase the economic pie for all of us. That is uh, been cardinal uh, virtue of the Republican party for nearly 25 years, but only 54% of the Trump voters believe it. This is again, an ideological question. 63% of very conservatives do, only 48% of the liberal and moderates do. And again, big split based on party switchers, 46% agree with supply side economics to party loyalists, 58%. Talking specifics about the small government agenda divides the Trump coalition rather than unites it. But let's see a little bit more about what might unite it on the next slide. Oddly enough, climate change is one of those issues. For all of the belief and the statements that the Trump coalition are filled with climate deniers, when we ask people a three point question, do you believe that climate change is real and that government action is needed to uh, deal with it immediately? Whether climate change is real, but that science and technology can help make its effects less severe, or whether climate change is not real and nothing should be done to combat it, a clear majority takes the second option. And another nine and a half percent take the first option, which is basically the climate alarmist position. So that means that two thirds of Trump voters believe that climate change is real and that something should be done about it. This too is an ideological position. A plurality of very conservative voters take the climate denialist position, but not even a majority. 45% take the middle position and a small four or 5% take the alarmist position. And as we can see, the very groups that Republicans tend not to do as well with, younger voters, college grads, and females, take the more climate realist as opposed to the climate denialist position. This shows that a moderate approach to climate change is something that will unite the majority of Trump voters while providing a branch and a bridge to get into the non-Trump majority of American voters. There's other uniting issues that we'll see on the next slide. You wanna know why people talk about America and bash the Democrats? It's because virtually everybody in the Trump coalition agrees. Look at these numbers. Christianity is under attack in America today. 89% of Trump voters agree. America is the greatest country in the world as opposed to simply one great country among many. In Pew polls, uh, Democrats are much likelier to take the uh, second position of one among many, but 89% of Trump voters say it's the greatest. The fear that America is being lost is also a uniting issue. Americans are losing faith in the idea that make our country great, 90%. And note that there's no difference between party switchers and party loyalists on this. And the idea that the mainstream media today is just a part of the Democratic Party, well, that's the most popular position of all. And it's one that is shared by over 90% of party switchers and 90%, 98% of party loyalists. This is why you hear about these issues a lot when you hear Republican candidates talk and when you hear Republican leaders talk, and it shows how you can unite Trump voters among more general senses of feelings about the nation as a whole than if you get into some of the messy specifics about policy on economics and how to adapt to the current situation. Next slide, please. Social issues are also a uniting issue, uh, issue uh, or group of issues among Trump coalition, uh, although it is less so than the pure cultural positions. The abortion issue, 78% are broadly pro-life. Again, that increases with your perceived ideological conservatism, but even 64% of liberal and moderate Trump voters say they are pro-life. They abortion should be illegal either in all circumstances or except in the cases of rape, incest, or a threat to the mother's life. Two thirds want to overturn Roe versus Wade. Note that that drops significantly among liberal and moderate voters. There seem to be a number of people who are pro-life in theory, but are perfectly content to let Roe versus Wade, which basically abolishes the pro-life position, remain the law of the land. But it's still a uniting issue. Opposition to same-sex marriage is also a uniting issue, although less so than abortion. And were we to look at age breaks, we would see a uh, significant difference on that. But notice too how this is one with severe ideological differences. 
that a vast majority of liberal and moderates say it should be legal, whereas a large number of very conservatives say it should be illegal. This is, again, something where if you speak about same-sex marriage, you divide the coalition, whereas if you speak about abortion, you tend to unite the coalition. Next slide, please. This slide talks about the strong differences that evangelicals have with the rest of the Trump coalition. One of the defining features of Republican intraparty primary politics for the last 30 years has been how the also ran, the second place candidate, tends to be the candidate that is the favorite of the religious right. Pat Buchanan in 1996, Mike Huckabee in 2008, Rick Santorum in 2012, and Ted Cruz in 2016, all became the favorite of the religious evangelical candidate and rode that group's dominance in early state caucuses and primaries, such as in the Deep South and Iowa, to knock out other rivals on the right. But these candidates always lose when they get to less evangelical dominated places, such as the Midwest, and especially the Northeast or the Pacific Coast. Why is that? It's because evangelicals are only 40% of the Trump coalition. And exit polls also showed that they are a minority among Republican primary voters. And non-evangelicals have a strongly different view on the very sorts of issues and very sorts of rhetoric that attracts the evangelicals to support their candidate. How many times have you heard people supporting evangelical or courting evangelical voters say how much of a faithful practicing Christian they are? Well, 30% of Trump voters say that it is very important to them that somebody do that. That rises to a majority of evangelicals, but virtually none of the 60% of majority who are non-evangelicals. Pro-life, that's something that's incredibly important to evangelicals, not so much to non-evangelicals. What about religion? How many times have you heard like Ted Cruz say that you have to start your day on your knees in prayer in the Oval Office? Well, 90% of evangelicals wanna hear that more than half of non-evangelicals do not consider it a strong priority. And take a look at the questions about religiosity expressed more generally. 77% of evangelicals say religion is very important to their life, but only 28% only of non-evangelicals do. So the candidate who talks about religion as being crucial to their own faith attracts one set while not attracting the other. And while 54% of evangelicals go to church or uh, well, church for evangelicals once a week or more, only 15% of non-evangelicals do. And in fact, as we'll see later on, 23% of Trump voters don't practice religion at all. They say they're atheist, agnostic, or have nothing in particular. This is one reason why the evangelical candidate, when they move into areas with significantly smaller numbers of evangelicals, loses the primaries, and when you move into places where they're virtually non-existent, they get destroyed. Take the census region of New England. According to our poll, only 9% of Trump voters in New England, which comprises, or uh, the Northeast, which comprises New England, New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, are evangelical. Think about the paltry percentages of the vote Ted Cruz got in the primaries there, often getting none or extremely few numbers of delegates. When, when you can't get any support, at an area that sends somewhere around a quarter of the delegates to the national convention, you've got a real problem getting nominated. And this is one of the big divides in the Republican party that a candidate who wants to become the next presidential nominee has to navigate. Next slide, please. Here's another sense of unifying issue. Why do you hear a lot about the second amendment? Well, it's because 81% of America of Trump voters think that's more uh, uh, think it's very important that a Second Amendment guarantees the right of every person to own a gun. Uh, is it more important to protect police abil officers' ability to fight crime than to protect citizens from excessive police violence? 84% say it's more important to protect the ability to fight crime than to protect citizens from excessive police violence. And what about the racial and gender questions that so animate the Democratic Party? Trump voters believe that Blacks, other racial and ethnic minorities, and women have a mostly fair chance to succeed in today's America. Polls from uh, the Voter Study Group, which I also helped direct, show that Democratic voters, and particularly Biden supporters, 
strongly disagree or have significantly less levels of agreement on this. These issues of a fair, gentle, good America that supports the ability of individuals to safely use guns and police officers to enforce the law is a unifying feature of the Trump coalition and no person who wants to lead it can safely disregard it. Next question, please. Democrats are bad, but take a look at some of these views about partisan polarization. Massive unity on ideas that Democrats don't believe in the ideas that make America great or that they want to eliminate the influence of traditional values in American life and culture. When you have a very hard view of partisan animosity, giving people the option to say that Democrats are mostly good people who have bad ideas or that they have lots of bad ideas whose ideas and actions will destroy the country, a majority of Trump voters take the hardest option. And again, this is very ideologically polarized. A third of liberals and moderates agree, so nearly 70% of very conservatives. But hold on, when we say, what about working with those people? Can we work with those people? 57% of the Trump voters would prefer to work together saying it's a good idea, only 43% it's a bad idea. And there you have the reverse ideological split. Those liberal and moderate voters, nearly three quarters of them think working together is a good idea, even as a third think that they're filled with bad people. And look at the very, look at the conservative voter. A majority of just conservative voters say the Democrats have a lot of bad people who will destroy the country, but nearly 60% think we should still work with them. That's something that you can you navigate to try and address the question of decreasing partisan polarization. You don't have to simply cotton to the idea that Democrats are awful and need to be opposed in all circumstances. You can be both against Democrats and for cooperation and unite the Trump coalition. Last slide, please. It's really important when you're thinking about the coalition to understand the difference between the party base and the party switcher. Remember, despite the fact that President Trump nearly won the Electoral College, he still got under 47% of the popular vote. The people who are loyal Republicans are very different demographically and attitudinally than the people that he attracted. 36% of the Romney Trump voter say they are working class or poor. The rest say they are upper middle class or middle class. 57% of the party switcher says that. The Romney Trump voter is much more evangelical Christian than the party switcher. And look at that religiously unaffiliated number. Only 19% of the Romney Trump voters said that they either were atheist, agnostic, practice nothing in particular, or practice something else other than a list of uh, religions that included non-Christian uh, options such as Judaism or Buddhism or Hinduism. 41% of the Obama Trump voter said that. This is significantly a number of people who may identify in some way as Christian, or, but they do not have any sort of religion in their lives. And then take a look at the liberal moderate split. Only 12% of the Romney Trump voter says they are liberal or moderate. 43% of the Obama Trump voter do. And if we expanded that out, the smallest share of people in the Obama Trump group is the people who say they are very conservative. This is not a group. The party switchers are not a group who should look at themselves and have the same demographic backgrounds as the people who are the party loyal to us. And what you need to do if you're a Republican leader is add to the Trump coalition rather than subtract. If you think you're going to attract new people who are the defected Romney non-Trump voters and you're willing to give up Obama Trump voters in the exchange, you're just shuffling deck chairs on the Titanic by removing one type of swing voter with another. This is one of the key lessons that you can learn from this survey is that adding by subtracting is a bad idea adding by adding is a great idea. With that, I'd like to close and I'd like to reiterate that the top lines will be available both on the website of the event and in the event summary. Cross tabs, the information that divides the questions into demographic subgroups will be available upon request either to the ethics press office, the AEI press office, or directly to me. Thank you for the opportunity to listen and I'm looking forward to hearing my panelists comments. Thank you very much, Henry. Uh, I want to remind everyone, if you have questions, please submit them by emailing samantha.goldstein at aei.org or on Twitter with the hashtag AEIGOPFuture. 
Henry, you've covered just an enormous amount of ground in a very succinct presentation. Um, I wonder if you could tell me what your top takeaway from this survey is, and then we'll turn to Kristen. Yeah, the top takeaway of the survey is that the Trump, uh, the Trump coalition is a conservative populist alliance where both halves need the other in order to thrive. And that despite that, we know from the election result, that's still just not enough. It needs the way for the Republican Party forward is preserving what you've got the conservative popular alliance and finding a way to add that extra three, four, 5% of the total vote in order to move from 46 and percent to 51 and percent. Thanks very much, Henry. Now let's turn to Kristen Soltis Anderson. Kristen is the author of an important book on the millennial generation. And she's one of the most astute analysts of the younger generation uh, in the Republican party today. Kristen, what struck you most about the survey? Well, thank you so much, Carlin, for that introduction. Thank you to Henry for conducting this research and to AEI for including me in this panel. This is a topic that I have uh, cared deeply about for over a decade um, since I started studying younger voters, why they were gravitating away from the GOP and what that might mean for the Republican Party moving forward. And of course, the Trump era really sort of blew up a lot of expectations and notions about what the Republican Party was and what it could be in the future. And I think this survey, you know, in Initially, I, I struggled with what my thoughts would be on what this survey means for the Republican coalition moving forward, because as we've, we've repeatedly noted, um, this is a, a survey of a thousand Trump voters, which is a very large coalition. It's a coalition of 74 million Americans, but that is not, unfortunately for the Republican Party, a majority coalition. That having lost the White House and now having lost both chambers of Congress, it's clear that there needs to be much more addition than subtraction moving forward. But the question is, is it possible to do much addition with the coalition as currently constructed? And so I looked at this survey with an eye toward understanding uh, what are the things that really bind this coalition together? What are the items where in this survey we see the highest levels of agreement between these different factions? I think as Henry thoughtfully pointed out and has done in his research over many years, he pointed out that the views even within the Republican Party are much more heterodox on both social and cultural and economic issues in many ways uh, than perhaps was, was previously acknowledged. Um, take for instance, uh, something like the, the question about supply side economics. Even voters who voted for Romney in 2012 and have stuck with Trump in 2020, only 58% of them agreed with supply side economics. Um, there's tons of research out there that does suggest there's a large coalition of people who are perhaps more economically moderate to progressive, uh, while at the same time being more sort of socially and culturally conservative than is typically, I think, given acknowledgement or credit uh, or attention in, in a lot of analysis of American politics. And Donald Trump, I, I think, successfully tapped into some of that in assembling his coalition. I'm less convinced that he has changed what voters believe so much as understood and revealed what was already there in terms of these kind of heterodox views that were already within the Republican tent. Um, it, it's notable to me, for instance, that in addition to these many divides around economic issues, such as what should the government's role be in terms of guaranteeing a good quality of life, there are also these divides around what I think 10 years ago we would have classified as the key social issues for the party, whether it's something like abortion or gay marriage, whereas Henry's data points out there are pretty sizable divides. An issue like gay marriage is not a unifying feature of, of the Trump coalition, nor frankly is something even as, as potent as an issue like Roe versus Wade, where you see that two to one divide. So instead, I went into this looking for what binds all of these people together. And what really seems clear is a, a sense of feeling under threat and feeling under siege. In the survey, 89% of respondents saying they believe that Christians um, are, are Christianity is under threat in America. 87% believing that white Americans are facing greater discrimination. And this aligns with other data points. For instance, Pew Research Center put out a survey this week where they asked people, who do you believe will be gaining or losing influence under the Biden administration? And Republicans and Republican leaning voters, two thirds of them say, people like me are going to lose influence in this country under the Biden administration. When it comes to evangelicals, again, two thirds believe they'll be losing influence. Uh, and there's, I think, a real sense of being under threat. And so what does that lead to? Um, in my Echelon Insights survey, we asked this past month, what do you believe is the goal of politics? To enact good public policy 
or to fight for the survival of the country as we know it. And according to Republicans, by about a two to one margin, they lean towards saying it's about survival more than public policy. And particularly, that's the case among Trump Republicans. All of which sort of leads me to the worry that what has bound the Trump coalition together is not policy, but rather a posture, a belief that people who feel under siege want someone who will be in the foxhole with them fighting against what they view as hostile forces outside. Um, you see that in these questions where people say they believe that Democrats are trying to take away America's traditional values. And, and where I struggle is I would very much like to see a Republican Party that puts forward a, a positive policy agenda that talks about uplifting the, the economic fortunes of, of Americans, that talks about human flourishing, and that is able to hold on to its current coalition, but do that hard work of addition. But where I struggle is that if the thing that is primarily binding this coalition together is this emotional sense of threat, does that actually foster an environment where you can have this forward-looking policy agenda that does bring people in? Or does it actually create a barrier? Um, and on, on that, I, I think that's an open question that I'm hopeful the other panelists can address. On the one hand, it certainly suggests a flexibility in terms of policy that Republicans can be perhaps a bit more adventurous in terms of prescribing things like paid family leave, et cetera, without fear that they are necessarily going to alienate their base. Because in some cases that base is stuck in the coalition for issues beyond kind of these, these economic uh, questions. But at the same time that this could be offering flexibility, does it mean that this is a coalition, if it is primarily bound together by, by issues like guns or race or religion, that is welcoming to someone who may be that suburbanite who was turned off from the Trump coalition and is looking for what's coming back? And that I think is the key problem that Republicans are going to be facing over the next, certainly two years while in opposition, um, that they will have to address as they head into a presidential election, where inevitably people will have to not just run on an opposition message, but on something positive. Um, and, and, and I really struggle with knowing how the Republican Party will grapple with the fact that what holds its coalition together right now, I do think has some limited, some has pretty limited appeal um, to those who are currently outside of it. So with that, I'd love to hand it back to my co-panelists. Thank you very much, Kristen. And now it's my pleasure to turn to my AEI colleague, Dan Cox, who directs the AEI Survey Center on American Life. And if you're not familiar with the new center, I urge you to visit AEI to look at the kind of work that Dan and his team is doing at AEI. It's really very, very interesting work overall. Dan is an expert on religion and religious polarization. And we've asked him to look uh, again at some of the things that he found most interesting in the survey. And I hope he'll talk about the religious angle overall. Dan. Thank you, Carlin, and, and thanks, Henry, so much for uh, giving me a, a shot at looking at this really fascinating survey. And Carlin, not to disappoint, uh, I will absolutely be looking at some of the, the religious breaks. And, and in fact, one of the first things that struck me in when I started playing around with the, the data is that the white evangelical Trump voters did not look that different from Trump voters as a whole. And you know, Henry may disagree with me a little bit on this stuff, but, but as a pollster, uh, you know, we tend to be biased towards looking for differences on issues or questions, uh, looking at groups that are distinctive from the rest. And, and you know, that's a really interesting story often. But in this survey with something like a hundred questions, you know, the white evangelical voters in the Trump coalition didn't seem to have such a unique profile when it came to politics. You know, religiously they are distinct, you know, in terms of practice and belief. But when it came to politics, um, they, they had a lot uh, mostly in common with other Trump voters. And I was actually paying particular attention to the white evangelical Trump voters and the non-religious Trump voters. And, and as Henry mentioned, there's actually a considerable amount of non-religious voters in, in Trump's coalition. And again, when it comes to basic policy questions, there's not a lot of daylight between them. Uh, the non-religious Trump voters tended to be a little more libertarian uh, on, on fiscal matters, uh, but both were solidly conservative on most of those economic questions. They're, you know, looking at issues of climate change or gun rights, uh, immigration, or what America's foreign policy posture should be. Again, white evangelical and the non-religious Trump voters tended to be pretty aligned. Uh, and as, as Kristen mentioned, the sort of central question on like, is uh, Christianity under attack? Uh, do you think white whites will face more discrimination? Again, there's widespread agreement among both the non-religious and the very religious aspect parts of, of Trump's coalition on those questions. 
The place where we did see some differences, uh, again, Henry alluded to this a, a bit on abortion and same-sex marriage, the, the white evangelical and non-religious voters differed on those questions, but Trump voters overall are actually more closely aligned with the evangelical position than the non-religious uh, part of his, his coalition. And you know, for me, that was really interesting. And it suggests that conservative Christians have become a more dominant faction in the current Trump GOP coalition. And that's really interesting given the history here. You know, at one point, conservative Christians operated uh, outside the Republican Party and the formal party apparatus. Uh, and then slowly they, be they began to take over some of the local and state party organizations. And it sort of came into conflict with some of the more moderate elements. And if you look back in the 80s and 90s, there was really considerable trepidation among certain segments of the GOP about welcoming, you know, fully welcoming the Christian right into the Republican fold. And the fear was that these voters you know, who were prioritizing cultural issues and questions would move the party too far to the outs outside the mainstream. And this has, I think, been an ongoing tension uh, in the GOP for, for a number of years, you know, how to hold on to these voters without pushing the party too far uh, to the political margins. And I think, you know, for that reason, some within the GOP have attempted in various ways to keep you know, these sort of most conservative Christian voters at arm's length. It's a really fascinating quote uh, I, I ran across from Richard Worthlin, who was President Reagan's pollster, uh, who said that you know it would be wise for uh, Republicans to appeal to religious conservatives in churches, but not not to be too public about uh, this, so as not to be linked to their their extreme views. And somewhat ironically, he said this uh, to a New York Times reporter. Um, but I think where where Trump really differed in his approach, and I think something that really endeared him to white evangelical Christians. Uh, was that he was consistently publicly and vocally embracing them, sometimes literally uh, throughout his presidency. And I think it's, it's, it's clear that white evangelicals I think, appreciated Trump's you know, more pugilistic tendencies, right? They, they wanted a fighter. You know, Kristen's mentioned this before, and, and I, I tend to agree with it. But I think he also, he made common cause with evangelicals by going after the groups or the institutions that they viewed were antagonistic to their own religious beliefs and values. And I think he basically signaled that, you know, your enemies are my enemies. Uh, and through that, you know, I, I think really gained uh, loyalty and support throughout his presidency. There's one example I think is worth mentioning. You know, early on in Trump's presidency, uh, he, he instituted this, um, you know, several immigration bans, but one particularly targeting um, people coming from predominantly Muslim countries. And this was, uh, I think, for, for many of, of the people in, in the, you know, the, the bubble, kind of a curious policy. It was not overly popular among the public, but it had tremendous support among white evangelical Protestants, many of whom uh, see Islam as sort of directly in conflict with American culture and values. And I think for, for this and many other reasons, uh, white evangelicals have been committed to Trump throughout his presidency. I think you know, his support dipped below 70%, maybe once uh, during the last four years. Uh, according to, to Henry's survey, um, you know, white evangelicals were much more likely to support Republican members who, who refused to certify the 2020 election results. Um, and because I'm a pollster and uh, I can't not talk about my own polls, uh, in something we're releasing next week, we actually found that, you know, given the choice of identifying with either Trump or the GOP, you know, white evangelicals were about 10 points more likely to, to identify with Trump than, than other Republicans. And so I think you know, the strength and durability of this evangelical commitment to Trump um, you know, was evident throughout. And in some ways it wasn't really, or it shouldn't have been as surprising as I think it was for, for some. You know, when you look at uh, evangelicals compared to other conservative groups, you know, even before Trump, you know, evangelicals generally viewed themselves as at, at odds with many of the secular culture uh, and political and, and cultural institutions in the US. They were more likely to distrust uh, mainstream media uh, higher ed, um, both of which they view as, viewed as, as being either antagonistic or, or sort of secularizing the country. Um, something that we also found in, in our polling was that um, white evangelicals, uh, Republicans compared to other Republicans are much more likely to believe um, conspiracy theories, whether it's QAnon or the deep state um, or that the 2020 election uh, was stolen from Trump. And so I think that's something that's you know, also really interesting. Uh, and, and moving forward, I think this re represents a, a pretty significant challenge for the GOP, um, but it's been an ongoing challenge. This is not really all that new, I don't think. Uh, 
Um, and something else that I think was evident during the last four years is there are a lot more culturally conservative voters in the US than, than um, many of us and many people in political science, I think, thought. Uh, and given the, the structural advantage that GOP currently enjoys, I think uh, the next several elections will be you know, incredibly competitive. For what is clear to me anyway, uh, is that you can't win a national primary without strong evangelical support. You know, Henry mentioned that 40% of Trump's voters were evangelical in, in the 2016 primary. Um, so even though there was a lot of hesitancy and, and reticence initially, or at least publicly, um, a, a significant number of evangelical voters still supported him. And so I think, uh, you know, I'll end on, on this note that I think that evangelicals will be, you know, an increasingly important force. And I think they're gonna be operating more with inside the party in determining its direction than, than outside. Um, but I, I welcome, uh, any disagreement on any of these points. Uh, again, thank you so much for the opportunity. Dan, thank you very much. And I'm sure we'll get to some of the, some have some questions about some of the things that you've raised in your presentation. Last but not least, we're going to turn to Sean Trendy. Sean is a perceptive analyst of historical and contemporary political and demographic currents, making him uniquely situated, I think, to address polls on the future of the GOP. Sean. Sean, I think you, you, you would think by this point in the pandemic, I would know how to unmute myself and you would be wrong. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and it's really, uh, it's intimidating going last in this group because I figured by this point, all the good stuff in the survey would be covered. Uh, and uh, I think that was uh, a justified fear. So I decided to do something a little bit different. Um, I took the raw data uh, from the survey and wanted to use some statistical techniques I won't go into to try to flesh out a little better what the divisions in this Trump coalition really are. Um, because if we're thinking about the Trump coalition and whether it's sustainable, knowing the fault lines along which it might fracture uh, is really important uh, when the GOP is thinking about what type of candidate it wants to nominate and maybe how far in a non-Trump direction it wants to go to try to add that extra three, four percent it would need uh, for a popular vote victory. So the first thing I did, uh, and for those who are interested, this is from a principal components analysis, but uh, I dropped kind of the gimme questions. Uh, do you think the election was stolen? Did you think it was fair? Uh, things that are kind of like a, a good straight up cue that you have a Trump voter uh, who's just really Trumpy uh, and wanted to look more at the ideological and the demographic and the, uh, the what we call the thermometer question. How do you feel towards these different groups? And what this PCA analysis does in short is it tries to boil down a bunch of questions into a few different ways that the data divide. In other words, if you have a bunch of questions where people answer them yes or no the same way, it tries to group those to, together and say, okay, here's a type of question where, where the, the data really starts to break down. So what do we see here? Um, the first, the, the strongest dimension in this data uh, is what we might call the group thermometer voters versus the ideology uh, and demographics voters. Well, what do I mean by this? On one pole of this dimension, you have people who are very influenced by questions uh, and very related uh, by attitudes towards things like immigrants, Hispanics, Muslims, African-Americans, uh, Mexican-Americans. Uh, on the other poll though, you have people who seem to be more motivated by the ideological questions. Do you believe the government creates wealth? Do you believe working with Democrats is good or bad? What are your attitudes towards racism? What is your religious identification? Uh, things of that nature. So, you know, I, I think a lot of this will make sense. It kind of echoes uh, what's been said before and what's been said in the general commentary, uh, but it's kind of interesting to see it borne out by this kind of unique survey of a thousand Trump voters. So one of the fault lines really is this kind of group threat uh, versus the more traditional uh, ideological voters. If you look on the second and third dimensions, what was kind of interesting to me uh, is you see a breakdown within the thermometer questions. And so when I looked really closely at, at what these questions were that kind of moved people heavily one way or the other, um, there was a group uh, thermometer 
versus an ideological group thermometer. So even in attitudes towards different groups, there's kind of a breakdown. Um, so when I say the general group thermometer, that is the, you know, do you, what is your feel, what are your feelings towards African-Americans, towards business persons, Christians and Hispanics? The ideological group, which again, I think it, it bears out that it's a little bit distinct from this uh, traditional group dynamic. What are your attitudes towards the World Health Organization? Your attitudes towards the UN, the World Trade Organization, Hollywood, feminists, China, NATO. Um, these are kind of this new emerging uh, division uh, and some traditional ones with, with Hollywood in there as well. But again, th this seems to be more of a ideological slash culture war aspect uh, versus the traditional in-group, out-group questions. Um, now, kind of the bad news is that these, you know, the, the, there, is a, there are a lot of ways that the Trump coalition breaks down. Uh, and so there, there are a million fault lines within it. Uh, and, and I don't have time to go into those, but those are kind of the major ones. To try to flesh things out even more, you know, I, I think one of the concerns for the Republicans going forward, and I think this was borne out in the Georgia runoffs, is what, who is just a Trump voter uh, versus who is a Republican voter who happened to vote for Trump. Keeping those voters, uh, in, keeping those Republican voters who happened to vote for Trump in the coalition and maybe trying to bring back the Republican voters who didn't vote for Trump, I think is one of the crucial uh, distinctions. It's a question of how do you do that then without alienating the, the Trump voter who just happened to vote Republican because he's a Republican or she. Uh, so for this, again, the mouthful that I used is stepwise logistic regression analysis. But what this tells us is of the questions in this data set, and there are a lot of really interesting questions, and I urge everyone to, to look at this, the, the actual YouTube report uh, and see all of them. It's just, it's just such a rich source of information. Um, but what did the most work in predicting whether a person would be a Republican first or a Trump voter first? Um, it turns out the strongest, the thing that did the most work among the statistically significant predictors controlling for everything else is whether you opposed the wall or supported the wall. If you oppose the wall, you're about two and a half, the odds of you being a, a Republican versus a Trump supporter increased by about two and a half times. Uh, so a big increase uh, in that. Again, that, that, that might be, you know, that's Trump's signature issue. But that suggests that backtracking on immigration going forward might be a good way for Republicans to lose a lot of these Trump voters. Another thing um, was attitudes towards diplomacy versus what we might have called back in the day peace through strength. Uh, if you believe diplomacy was the way to peace, uh, you were about twice as likely all other things held equal to identify as a traditional Republican versus a Trump voter. The Trump voters were much more likely to say, to believe in peace through strength. What made you less likely to be a uh, traditional Republican? Um, if you believe that the main job of uh, the police or, or going forward with police was to protect citizens uh, from police violence, you were way less likely to be a traditional uh, Republican. Uh, if you believe that government should do less, I'm sorry, if you believe that government should do more, all of the things being equal, you're about half as likely to be a traditional Republican. Um, if you were, uh, if you believed that uh, trade decreased jobs, you were about half as likely, all of the things being equal, uh, to be a traditional Republican. So it's interesting, this, this kind of echoes a lot of what Henry was getting to uh, in his presentation, but it suggests that even with, that these are not just things that show up in the uh, data set, these are things that really divide kind of traditional Republicans versus Trump Republicans. Even if, even if you get a lot of traditional Republicans who might say, yeah, I wanna build a wall. Nevertheless, in, if you're just kind of looking at the odds and how you predict someone being a traditional Republican versus a Trump voter, when you put controls in place, that has a big effect. Now, those are the kind of the six 
strongest predictors of whether someone is a traditional Republican or a Trump Republican. There are some other things. And again, this, this perhaps bears out uh, your, your, our traditional understanding of the coalitions, but it's just interesting to see this flesh out even among uh, this unique data set of just Trump voters. Uh, people who, who uh, self-described as poor or working class were much more likely to consider themselves Trump voters rather than Republican voters. Um, people with high levels of education were much more likely to consider themselves traditional Republicans versus Trump voters. We hear the story about how Trump energized a lot of working class voters and got them to turn out to vote for them. But this data set suggests that those voters are still Trump voters uh, and are not yet Republican voters. Again, this can help explain the loss in Georgia. If you look at the places where Republican turnout was down from the general election to the uh, runoff election, it was places like Northwestern Georgia and far Southeast Georgia, places that have a lot of whites without college degrees. The explanation then would be, these are people who turned out in the general to vote for Trump. Uh, but then when the runoff came around, we're not so interested in just voting for a Republican. There are some ideological questions that divide a uh, Trump voter uh, from a Republican voter. If you believe that Roe versus Wade should be affirmed by the Supreme Court, you're about twice as likely, all of the things being equal, to be a, a Republican voter versus a Trump voter. If you think that Trump's, uh, that, that Democrats believe in making America great, you're about twice as likely to be a traditional Republican uh, voter versus a Trump voter. If you believe that climate change is fake or systemic racism is fake or uh, that you shouldn't be, have to get a job to receive benefits, that made you much more likely uh, to be a Trump voter. So again, we kind of see this, this cultural conservatism combined with more economic populism in the Trump coalition. Finally, one thing that is interesting, and there, there, I, I want to wrap up so we have plenty of time for questions, but the faith angle that, that Henry got at in his presentation is borne out by this analysis as well. One thing that's interesting, though, is that when you run this logistic regression analysis to try to control for everything else, the attitude questions or the thermometer questions are statistically significant, but they aren't practically significant. In other words, yes, these questions do divide uh, the Trump voter and separate them from the traditional Republican voter. But practically speaking, to put it in, in geek terms, the coefficients are very small. Uh, to put it in practical terms, it doesn't, even though you can differentiate this way, it doesn't really increase your chances or your odds of being a Republican or a Trump voter that much either direction. Uh, so there is a real divide there, but in terms of the actual impact on numbers of Republicans versus Democrats, not that significant. In short, we do see things that divide the traditional Republican voter from the Trump voter. Uh, they are things like attitudes towards immigration, a strong, uh, aggressive, muscular foreign policy, uh, some atti attitudes towards the police and what their role in society is, and then some, the traditional populist questions. The traditional Republicans are more likely to be traditional small government Republicans, whereas this new burgeoning Trump coalition really is more likely to favor an activist government role. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sean, and thank you to Kristen and also to Dan for those very thoughtful comments on the survey. That you, It is an incredibly rich survey, I think, as you can tell from the areas that they focused on overall. We're going to turn to your questions in just a minute, but Henry, I'd like to ask you if you would could quickly respond or have anything you want to say about any of the panelists' presentations. Yeah, um, I, I often wish that I had Sean's data skills and I appreciate his uh, uh, use of uh, um, statistical analysis to find fissures. I think that's incredibly important going forward. Um, with respect to the religious differences and uh, or non-differences, I appreciate Dan's uh, comments. Uh, and uh, you know, it is very interesting how I think, you know, you're absolutely right that it's not so much policy that distinguishes the evangelical, it's cultural cues, you know, that may distinguish them, you know, which is why I focused on the questions of, how important is it that somebody profess their faith as opposed to what do you believe about pro-life uh, that seems to be more distinguishing. Um, and I agree with Kristen that it's very difficult. It's not easy to see where you go forward from here with this coalition. Uh, 
you know, my concern overall is that there's a very strong institutional bias within the Republican Party to downplay the Fishers in the Trump coalition and say it's going to be kind of easy for us to keep these new voters and add by going back to the things that we all feel comfortable with. And I think that's something we just need to resist, uh, that uh, those fissures are real. Uh, I don't think because you got a Latino vote in the Rio Grande Valley this time, that means you're going to get it four years from now or that the sort of, you know, it, you, it doesn't take very much uh, slippage in the secular white working class vote that seems to just love Trump Republicanism, but never was very interested in Romney Republicanism, you know, you lose a little bit of that and suddenly all those margins in the upper blue, uh, up the blue wall states in the upper Midwest start fading in the Democrats favor. And it's just, I would just say it's yes, you know, it's very hard to see how we go from here uh, with this coalition. I think it's harder to see how we go from here without it. Thanks very much, Henry. As you might expect, there are a ton of questions and let's get started with them. Here's the first, this one's near and dear to my heart as someone who studies polls at AEI. Uh, given concerns raised about the 2016, 2020 polling failures to pick up Trump voters, how confident are you that this poll captured those voters? Henry, I think that's probably for you. Yeah, you know, I, I think, um... We have to be reasonably confident. If anything, what I think uh, we saw in 2020 was that a certain set of the uh, white working class or low socioeconomic status Trump voter did not answer uh, polls. Uh, and so to the extent that this doesn't capture a group that polls have towards the culturally conservative, economically populist wing of uh, the Trump coalition, because that's what the data seemed to suggest that to the extent there was a polling error that people missed. And that too is something that Republican strategists need to understand. I'd be curious about all the panelists' reaction to this question. Where does the sense of threat come from that you say is a unifying factor among Trump voters? What do Trump voters cite as the cause of these threats? Are they economic in their roots or are they rooted in social change or what? I mean, any of the panelists can respond to that. Henry, you start quickly. I have thought for a long time that uh, what unites uh, Trump voters is the sense, as somebody said, under siege, you know, fear, scared. Uh, but they're scared about different things. The religious voter is scared that their religion is going to be extirpated. The blue collar is voter is uh, afraid that uh, their chance to practice, uh, participate in the American dream is going to be uh, taken away. The person who's worried about immigration is afraid that changing demographics is going to place them at a social disadvantage. What unites Trump coalition it, under the rubric of America is that sense of siege and under uh, being under uh, siege. But I think what fuels it is very different depending upon where the voter comes from. So it's a singular siege mentality with multiple forces that are sieging different castles. Kristen, Dan, or Sean, reactions to that? I, I think liberalism and uh, especially, you know, progressivism, which I do increasingly see as a distinct uh, ideology uh, has become, I mean, mu more, much more muscular uh, in the last 10 years and its willingness to kind of deploy its cultural power uh, in pursuit of its goals. Um, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't have strong opinions. As strong, everyone seems to have a strong opinion on the Trump Twitter ban. I don't on the merits. What I do see uh, is, is, you know, a big company flexing its power on, on cultural issues. Uh, you can see it with so-called cancel culture. You can see it with some of the more, you know, things that I think would have been unthinkable a few year, a decade ago, um, you know, for photographers who refused to, to serve gay, uh, the same sex weddings. You know, I, I think when I was first thinking about it, the thought that they, you would actually prosecute these people or find them just seemed fantastic. It was like, that was like a scare story you would try to tell in opposition to marriage equality. Um, you combine this with, you know, middle America really being 
hollowed out. You know, I, I drive through southeastern Ohio and you can see it in the towns, the, the, the closed down factories and it's like a Bruce Springsteen song. Um, so I, I just think there's a lot of things uh, just kind of coming together that really make cultural conservatives feel like they are, are losing and that because of the cultural power of the people wielding it makes them feel like they're losing unfairly. And, and critically to, to Sean's point, and, and this sort of weaves in Henry's as well, it's not just a sense about, say, religion or, or even, you know, practicing evangelical Christianity or something like that, because many people in the Trump coalition, that's not necessarily their frame of reference for, for how they're feeling concerned. I think what's most interesting in some ways is that those conventional abortion, gay marriage kind of issues, you do see a, a, a perhaps a wider variety of, of stances on those issues in this poll than you might have expected. But instead, it is it is more of that people like me versus big institutions and can I continue living my way of life or are institutions going to come for me that's the issue? Dan? Yeah, no, I think there there is something real happening here. And if you, you look at just the, the rapid change in the religious landscape over the last 20 years, right? We've gone from like six or 7% of, of the country being religiously unaffiliated to now it's like one in four. If you look at under people under 30, it's like close to 40% now. So there, there's this sort of tectonic shift in religious identity and commitments with churches being hollowed out, particularly in a lot of these same, you know, rural communities that are being economically devastated. So there's a, there's a lot of change going on really quickly. Um, cultural attitudes are obviously evolving rapidly as well. And so it, I think it feels like sort of being under duress from all different you know, aspects of your life, from culture, religion, uh, economic. And so I think these kind of things uh, are, are felt every day. And then I think you know, there are, um, you know, whether it's Fox News or Tucker Carlson, people sort of saying, yes, you should be afraid. You know, look at what's, ha what, look what's happening. And I think that just sort of helps focus, um, uh, you know, attention on those issues. Thanks, Dan. Here's another good question. What is the takeaway from the survey for an entity like the Republican National Committee, which is by necessity already focused on the 2022 midterms, where we may see more GOP incumbents facing primary challenges than previously anticipated? Who wants to start with that? Henry? Sure, I was uh, letting my pa panelists jump in okay. first. You know, first of all, the RNC is going to be an entity that's largely going to stay neutral They uh, and that they are party builders. You know, it's uh, with respect to primary challenges, that's really a question that the NRCC has to answer. And my argument is that what people want, uh, you're gonna have the hardcore uh, people who are just against the establishment. But there's got a lot more people who would like to see a party that actually represents them. And that means taking a more muscular stance in favor of issues that the pre-Trump Republican Party largely did not adopt. So I've written before that if Liz Cheney wants to beat back her challenge, challenger, what she needs to do is co-opt the challenge. What she needs to do is come up with a unique way in which she can be aggressively anti-China and aggressively uh, anti-immigrant. That's not simply mimicking Trump. And because Trump was so non-policy specific, there's a legion of ways. But what you have to do is say, look, I'm angry too. I'm fighting too. And then what you do is get the credibility of these people to create that con conservative populist fusion in a responsible way as opposed to an irresponsible nihilist way. Other panelists re responding to that? Yeah. I, I, this, oh, go ahead, Sean. No, absolutely not, you go. Well, this is, it's less of a advice for say the RNC, because again, I, I suspect large portions of the Republican sort of apparatus will want to kind of stay back and see how those things play out. But I do think a lesson for Republican policymakers who are trying to figure out with this coalition that's held together by some things that are more emotional than policy oriented, where are the areas of, of policy, uh, where are the areas that we don't talk about enough in terms of policy, where there seems to be some interest and flexibility within this coalition? And I think that climate change question in this survey is so fascinating because not only do you have uh, majorities um, saying, yes, we believe climate change is real, we'd like a solution, perhaps not a government solution, we'd like private sector innovation on this front. But I think that differs from this notion of the Trump coalition as being 
climate change is fake, let's just focus on coal. And particularly if we're really focusing on the future of the Republican Party, what do these younger people in the Trump coalition stand for? There are huge differences on this particular question. Young Trump supporters, I believe it was over 80% of them believe climate change is happening and wanna see something done about it. Um, so there's really, I think, areas where Republicans can get creative by putting forward policy solutions that in the past, they've just sort of sat back and said, no, 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 if we touch this, it's just a division within our coalition. I don't think so. I think talking about something like clean energy is a very interesting way to make overtures to those you know, suburban voters who walked away from the GOP without necessarily violating uh, the coalition that you've already got. Sean. Yeah, one of the things that has me a little concerned, you know, we, we've had, we have these populist flare-ups in the US from time to time, um, and traditionally what has happened is that one of the major parties co-opts them so, and, and then kind of channels them. So you have the Democrats in, uh, in the 1890s merging uh, with the populists and the Democratic Party changes from being a, uh, you know, kind of classic Jeffersonian party to being, you know, that's what really puts it on the path to being the New Deal party. Um, you know, FDR is really concerned about Huey Long uh, in the 1930s, and that's part of why the second and third New Deal shift leftward. He's trying to capture that populist ideology without letting it run rampant. Um, I'm concerned that, especially among elites, there's not a lot of, there's, there's too much resistance in the parties to trying to capture and, and consolidate this, this populist energy. You know, part of how we got Trump was that the GOP base said in 2005, we don't want this comprehensive immigration reform package. In 2014, they said, no, really, we don't want this gang of eight bill, don't pass it. And then in 2015 and 2016, the GOP establishment goes up and lines, behind, lines up behind Jeb Bush. And I like Jeb Bush. Um, I'm, I might I might have been happy with him as a Republican nominee, but given that background, it was a crazy place uh, to put uh, the resources. So th there needs to be some movement towards there. There needs to be some give um, from the GOP establishment, uh, or this is going to get really, really bad. Yeah. Henry, this is a, a quick question for you. Given that about 90% of self-identified Republicans voted for Trump, according to the exit polls, how different is this survey sample from simply Republican voters? Um, it's going to be different on the margin, and it's because there are going to be people who will say they're independents, but uh, lean, if you push lean Republican, uh, who did not vote for President Trump, but will participate in Republican primaries, and you've got the 10% of uh, self-described Republicans. Uh, again, it's not that this is unrepresentative of Republican voters, uh, but there are people in this survey who will not participate in Republican primary, but uh, will vote. Trump Republican. Uh, and then you've got the people who will participate in Republican primary. So I would say this is kind of a survey of just roughly 70 to 80 percent of the re expected Republican primary base. So it is a dominant, but it is not a wholly exclusive. And virtually everybody in that extra 20 to 30 percent is going to be somewhere in that I'm a Republican first, I'm not a Trump person first, because they've already demonstrated that by the way they treated Trump. So I would guess that this you know, again, just to put a rough number is 75 or 80 percent of the 2024 Republican primary electorate. But that extra 20 to 25 percent is decisively in the non-Trump camp and has the attitudes of the non-Trump camp. Thanks, Henry. I think we have time to get in one more question, but I first want to thank all of the panelists and Henry too, and, and the Ethics and Public Policy Center for, for supporting this survey. And as we told you earlier, the top lines will be available very soon and we'll provide subgroup analysis to anyone who would like it. Here's the final question for any of the panelists. If I were a Democrat, what does the poll tell me about how I might take some of the voters who supported Trump in 2020 and add them to the Democratic tally in 2022 or 2024. What are the lessons for the Democrats in this survey? Who wants to take a crack at that first? Sean, Kristen? Sure. I can go quickly. Uh, I, I think that the, the economic issues pose perhaps the most fertile ground. I think most of the cultural issues, there's just no way to envision the Democratic coalition making overtures on any of that considering uh, where the center of gravity is in the Democratic Party these days. But you can even see it with these debates around things like COVID relief. You know, Mitt Romney coming out and saying, I want to give $3,000 for every child in America and facing backlash within his own party. That's the sort of thing where 
you can see Democrats going, again, I, I'm not certain that Democrats embracing Mitt Romney equals Democrats absorbing <laughs> some of the Trump coalition for a variety of reasons. But I think, uh, I think it's the, the sort of economic stimulus, uh, quality of life type issues uh, that, where there's the greatest opportunity for Democrats to peel some of those folks away. Anyone else very quickly? I think uh, I have long said Joe Biden was the only one who would have voted Trump or who, who would beat Trump um, of the group because he was able to be a little bit more moderate in the election on some of these cultural issues. And I think this, this survey is consistent with that. And that is something Democrats should remember for 2024. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Thank the Ethics and Public Policy Center, Henry Olson, and a wonderful panel for a great discussion this morning. And we hope to see you again soon. Thanks so much.